Hi, Mike Kennedy with you here, and I thought we'd continue on with some little Polaroid uh, history. So we did the integral film type cameras, which was the uh, Polaroid Sun 660. They also had a, uh, a later camera that uh, much more high-end called the SX-70 that used an integral film too, but, but it was a different format. <coughs> now let's look at this. This is we're going back again, and now we're talking about uh, pack film cameras. Let's look at this. Uh, now this was just the first camera I happened to grab out of my collection. Let's get a cold clip. We're going to explain how that was used. And first, we're going to open the camera up fully. Okay, here we have it. This is a, Molar a Polaroid Model 240, and this took pack film. Unfortunately, I don't have a pa the actual pack to show you, but what would happen is, uh, you can see the bellows on this one are a little deformed here. <coughs> but you would drop uh, this plastic cartridge in that was loaded with the paper and the chemicals. And again here you can see we have our roller system, which is an, again the extremely important part of the Polaroid system. These rollers can come out of the camera and be cleaned, which was a major thing that you had to do uh, to keep your camera running well. Okay, so you would drop your film in and uh, you would pull a tab out. Now unlike the uh, previous cameras to this that used the roll film, they actually had like two rolls of film, a print roll and a negative roll that would come together. Those, that camera, and I'll show you one of those later, uh, you'd actually have to open the back of the camera and peel the print off. With this, you would pull it outside and the, the film and uh, the negative and the print would be touching each other and they would have to stay in contact for a certain length of time then you would peel them apart. Now if it was cold out, of course uh, we have this concept of chemistry that for every 10 degrees centigrade it affects a chemical reaction by, I believe, 25% uh, changes the time of the chemical reaction in general, so that uh, if it became cold, your prints would not, if you open them up, they wouldn't be completely developed. So if it was 65 or, low or colder, you would put the print in this to keep it warm. And this cold clip, you would have been keeping inside an inside pocket on your body to keep it warm. Uh, it says here, uh, if it's just between 65 and 40, you just keep it in a warm pocket. But if it's 40 degrees or below, you'd actually have it between your body and your arm and develop for 60 seconds. So this was just a me method of uh, having a warm spot for the film to develop. Now what was interesting about these models were, again, they, they had a whole series, the model 100, 200, 300, 400. And so each model number as you went had more features to it. Okay, so here we've gotten to the 240, the 250 would have been the highest model number. But what was nice about this is, uh, you could of course dial in your speeds. You had ASA 3000, which was black and white film, and ASA uh, 300, ASA 150, and ASA 75. 75 was the color product. But like I say, you had you had a uh, the, oh well, you had the the color uh, film too as well. Uh, now, what was especially nice about the higher models were two well. I'll mention three things. They had a glass lens, okay? This glass lens is a very nice lens. Able, I believe it's an f8.8 lens. Uh, 
able to produce really sharp, sharp prints. Okay, has a controlled lighten and darken. Has a flash contact. You could mount a flash on it. Um, but here's the thing that's kind of interesting here. If you can see this lever here that I push, you had two modes of operating this. And one was for this uh, 75, 150, and 300 speed. And that was for bright sun only, or for the 3000. And what that did is, if you can see in there, can you see there's a, there's a little plate that goes in there that stops the lens down? I've kind of got a reflection in the way. Ah, there, I think you can see it there. Okay, and that would stop the lens down to about, I believe, f50. But the advantage to having one of the cameras with this lever was you could use the, the ASA 3000 black and white film, the high speed film, film indoors without a flash. So that was, that was something quite novel to be able to do that. And, I, uh, you know, the black and white original Polaroid film was very, very high speed. And, you know, it was quite grainy, but it was a print, so it was still quite pleasing. And uh, I want to mention something about the viewfinder, too. With the higher models, you had uh, an integral viewfinder. That means when you look through the, the uh, camera, I don't know if we can see this or not. There it is. See, it's kind of hard to see, but see that yellow block in the center there? There would be a yellow image and a regular color image, and you would focus it by pressing here. You can see that's moving the lens closer or further to the, the film plane, which is focusing it for far away or close up. But by aligning those two uh, images, you could be assured that you would be an exact focus. And that's, that's an important concept, the range finder. Uh, we may talk about that more, uh, how that works in a later video. But the less expensive camera didn't have it integral. In other words, you'd have to look through the range finder, focus it, then you'd have to switch over and look through the viewfinder. So it was kind of like a more of a two-step process where this, you just had the one. And of course, this was a little more complicated to make the technology, so it was more expensive. You could just focus by uh, guesstimate, which would probably work okay when you were s the camera was set to the, uh, the smaller setting, the F50 setting. The depth of field would be considerably uh, uh, greater, especially for f far away objects. I don't think you'd want to do anything real close with that. Now, Polaroid manufactured a bunch of accessories that would go with these too. Once you went up to the higher models, uh, there were a number of close-up or portrait lenses. They would come with a lens, and s they would come with uh, something to fit over the viewfinder so that you could collect correct for the parallax. What's parallax? What this sees and what the lens sees is, is different because they're in different locations. They're, they're separated by yeah, approximately four inches. And while that doesn't amount to much when you're photographing a tree or a house, when you're trying to f photograph something 20 inches away, that's a big deal. The fact that this is moved over a little too from the lens is a big deal. So they would have these markings inside the viewfinder by which you could re or correct that effect, which was called parallax correction. Okay? So they had a number of, uh, they also had a number of filters. If you wanted to use the uh, black and white film and put a yellow filter, they would have a filter that would go on here. Then it would have a little arm that would come over and go over the photocell. This is the photocell that is measuring the light. It's all automatic exposure. Although technically you could say you had the, 
the, uh, it was still all automatic, but you had the choice of the two F numbers, the F50 or the F8.8. .8. So to me, this, uh, this was the heyday uh, of, of real quality with, a, with what I call the Polaroid film and the Polaroid era, when they had all these uh, model, uh, they had the 100, 200, 300 and 400, and it went up to the 450 model. And uh, uh, the ones with glass lenses were just outstanding for sharpness. You got accurate fo exposure, uh, different settings. You had you had a really wealth of film you could try. They had several contrasts of of color film that you could have, depending on what you wanted to do. Uh, they had several. They had a black and white product. They had. It was just amazing. And like I said, I mentioned in my other video, the product I liked the best was, you would peel this thing apart. With the the a certain black and white one, it was called the positive negative, and instead of discarding that negative, which you would use to throw it away, it actually had a clear base. So you would take that out, wash it off. And ideally, to make it long-term storage, you put it in sodium sulfate for a certain length of time, and then you'd have this nice, big, sharp negative. And that was really, really nice. Now, one thing uh, that was is odd about these is they all took this, as you can see here, this odd 4.5 volt battery. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is, is no longer available. But you know what I used to do? Back in the day, when these were in their heyday, and it was still expensive to shoot the film. Back then, it was it was about a buck a shot. And that was fairly expensive, especially when uh, photo finishing was cheap. Uh, you could get you know a whole roll of film uh, developed for you know with 36 exposures anywhere from three to seven bucks, depending on how you did had it done. You could have all those prints made. So uh, I think. A lot of people had these cameras and decided that they no longer were going to use them. They were just too expensive. So what I did is I would buy a camera like this at a yard sale. Like far, this is okay. We're talking back in the we're talking back in the 80s now. So you'll have to inflate these prices. But I'll tell you the prices I did. I'd get one of these for five dollars. Invariably. The rollers would be all caked up with chemicals that I showed you. These rollers can come out and be clean. So I, I would pull out those rollers and uh, uh, clean them. And usually that meant now the camera was in perfect working condition. But a what I did too a lot of times is I would just cut out this, uh, uh, this battery connection completely and uh, replace it with three AAA cells. I mean, AA cells back then, AA cells would fit in here. You could get a holder and put three. So therefore, you had a camera that you could, now you had a camera that worked, and uh, you could get batteries for it anywhere. AA batteries like they are now were just sold everywhere. That was the main battery of choice. Now we seem to be moving to AAAs more for, for things. Uh, so and so, I would buy that for five dollars. Take it home, clean it up. You know, clean the lenses. Uh, sometimes I would even mongrel parts together, like steal, you know, parts off one camera and put them on another camera. In other words, if I had two uh, two hundred models that weren't complete, I would switch some of the components to make one that was complete. Complete. Well, what I would do then is sell it for $35 to a realtor. And uh, you know, I'd have made a little money back then doing that. So, uh, but now, pack film is non-existence. It's funny though, these cameras are uh, having a reinsurgence of interest as people search out and still try to find film that works. A Polaroid, uh, discontinued it, but somehow Fuji continued making it. I don't know how uh, Fuji was allowed to 
to do it because uh, Polaroid had a big suit against Kodak for doing some instant film, but they never tried to sue Fuji, so I assume there was some licensing there. I don't know that what the story was, or somehow Fuji was able to do it out around their patent, but I don't even see how that was possible. So anyway, in later years, there's Fuji film available for this. So, you know, it is possible, and people still find working pack film that they can put in these cameras and uh, work. But of course, you buy film that's very old, you run the risk of it not working at all, it being dried out, uh, the images being uh, defective because of, you know, just because of age. And sometimes uh, they work perfect. So there you go. There's the pack film camera. And the next video we're going to try to do a uh, the older camera style camera that actually used the paper roll.